Hello and welcome everyone to Theorycraft, the series where we take concepts and make theoretical techniques to accomplish the goals we set for ourselves. In this episode, we're going to be exploring the properties of slime blocks and seeing how we can use them to make massive quarries that extract materials from the Minecraft world and collect them in chests fully automatically. But as always, before we do any theory crafting itself, we need to know exactly how slime blocks work. After all, we cannot make extremely complicated machinery without knowing how to make simple slime block mechanisms. So, let's get started. Slime blocks have this really interesting property of connecting to the blocks around them. Some blocks which come into contact with the face of a slime block are classed as connected blocks. When a block is connected to a slime block, it will move wherever the slime block moves. However, on the contrary, the slime block will not move wherever the connected block moves. That is, unless the connected block is also a slime block. This ultimately means that we can move multiple blocks at once with only one piston. But how many blocks can we push? Well, the slime block limit is set to 12. That is, every piston can only push a maximum of 12 blocks. If the structure being pushed by the pistons is more than 12 blocks, the piston will not push at all. So which blocks can become connected to slime blocks? The answer to this question is quite simply, all blocks which can be pushed by pistons. Any block which isn't pushable by pistons, like redstone, obsidian and tile entities, are also not connectable blocks. Slime blocks also update in such a way that specific constructions can produce budded pistons. For example, in this construction, the last slime block is block 36 when the piston tries to push again. Block 36 is a tile entity and thus cannot be pushed. Then the block 36 converts to a slime block, creating a budded piston. All this happens within a single game tick. To get around the 12 block limit, we can make use of budded piston worms. These constructions are specifically a bud switch, which upon updating moves the construct in front of it forward by one block. This means we can move big structures by moving many smaller structures and therefore overcoming the 12 block limit. Finally, a rail can be moved by a slime block if and only if there is only one slime block which is being moved, the piston pushing the slime block is a sticky piston, and the sticky piston pushing the block receives a pulse less than or equal to two game ticks. For some other tips and tricks about slime blocks, I would strongly urge watching Cuba Hamster's ultimate slime block tutorial. He's got some great videos coming up, but even the first two parts of his tutorial are extremely interesting and captivating. Simple complexity. The beauty of slime block systems is their high composability. Composability is a system design principle that deals with the interrelationship of components. A highly composable system provides recombinable components that can be selected and assembled in various combinations to satisfy specific user requirements. The two essential requirements for composability are as follows. Number one, the component must be modular and able to work without the requirement of other components around it. Two, each component must be stateless and every input must be independent from and unrelated to any previous request. For example, let's take a look at one of the most complicated machines I have seen so far. Cube Hamster's Gargantua is a giant walking robot, and at first glance, it must look like an extremely complicated mess of slime blocks and pistons. However, Gargantua itself is made out of lots of smaller, simpler components. The legs and weapons, for example, work independently of most of the other components. The final important step was just linking all these components together in a compact and concise way, but it could also be linked up in such a way that it wasn't compact and it was spread out. 
Ultimately, all components in Gargantua are modular and able to work without the requirement of all of the other components. For example, the legs will work without the requirement of the rockets being there. Sadly, not all components are stateless. For example, while moving, Gargantua cannot fire some of its weapon systems. Block to item conversion. Ideally, we would like to convert the blocks mined by the quarry into items, and we would like to place these items into chests. To convert the blocks into item form, we can use a wither inside a mobile wither cage. It is of course impossible to collect these items with hoppers, since hoppers are tile entities, so instead we would use hopper minecarts to pick up the items and distribute them amongst storage minecarts. Alternatively, if a mobile wither cage cannot be created for whatever reason, we can have little cargo ships go back and forth between the quarry and a stationary wither cage. These cargo ships would go in a straight line back and forth with cargo bays on either side, a stationary cargo bay to unload blocks off the cargo ship, and one mobile cargo bay to load blocks onto the cargo ship. If the quarry were to move in a direction perpendicular to the cargo carrier's direction, multiple intermediate cargo bays could be used. Now let's explore potential methods that I came up with, which we could use in the design for a fully automatic quarry. Method 1. The Onion Peel Method Strip, pick and collect, disassemble, transport and reassemble. This is what the onion peeler does on a loop. Firstly, we would use JL's Piston Harvester to strip off a layer from the land. We would repeat this process until the blocks have been raised to a specified level. When the strippers have reached the end of the line, they are disassembled, transported, and reassembled by piston mechanisms. At this point, we have the strippers ready to go, but before they can do their job, we need to deal with the layer of earth above. So next we send in the cargo ships. These would fly to the outer rim of the strip and upon colliding with the outer edge would automatically return back to a stationary cargo bay at the beginning. Here the blocks are removed and the process is repeated. If it is not possible for the cargo ships to automatically return when colliding with the edge of the strip, we could use a final overarching flying machine which holds this function which flies forwards once every phase. If a sufficient flying machine was found that required no blocks below the layer to work, you could actually use this without the peeling flying machines. This would have a great advantage of having a way to deal with gravel and other falling blocks. However, this method is quite slow. Number two, the crane and chain method. The crane and chain method uses a two-part mechanism to quarry blocks. The first is a movable head whose parts have the ability to move freely in the y-axis and in one direction in the x-axis. The second part is the chain which carries all the control of the quarry head. The crane arm would ultimately be made out of modules a bit like the legs of Cube Hamster's Mega Gargantua. The crane arm would be moved downward and then upward each time the chain moves it forwards. When the arm reaches the end of the chain, it is pulled out of the ground and the blocks are taken away to be processed. The chain is made out of many smaller modules of four slime blocks with two pistons and two redstone blocks connected. These little modules can be sent around in a loop to create a chain which can push the crane arm along to the other side. The downside to this method is that it is the slowest of all of the three methods and has a problem with gravel and other falling blocks. Number three, the line by line method. The line by line method involves a single flying machine flying over picking up a single line of blocks and carrying them to the end point. At the end, the flying machines are decomposed and reconstructed back at the beginning, and the process repeats. It is also possible to use a two-way flying machine to fly backwards and forwards, taking lines of blocks from the outside in, creating a faster quarry. 
This is by far the most expandable of all the other methods, with the potential to strip off and harvest whole layers in a very few amount of sweeps. However, its biggest downfall is the complications required when it comes into contact with falling blocks like gravel. It is quite likely we will have to use a combination of the three methods above, however, to deal with certain situations that may arise. For example, the line by line method is by far my favourite method and would be the fastest method, however, it might be hard to get an expandable design which deals with gravel effectively. To push the flying machines from one side to the other, it may be best to use a chain from the crane and chain method. Since water only flows downhill, and we mine from the top down, water undesirably updating pistons will never happen. The only remaining issue is how do we deal with immovable blocks like obsidian and dungeon chests. This is where the whole system starts to become trickier. If we can pinpoint exactly where the immovable block is, it is possible to use wither blockbusters captured by a similar machine as that of the ghast ball catcher from episode 1 of Theorycraft. These blockbusters can destroy immovable blocks such as obsidian, but may be hard to get into the right position. Alternatively, we could send a special flying machine over each layer after all the blocks have been removed, which checks for immovable blocks. If it finds an immovable block, we could just make the quarry freeze completely and carry a special block back to the wither destroyer, like a glass or ice block, which sets off an alarm notifying the player that he needs to travel to the quarry to deal with the immovable block. But sadly, I do not have all the answers, but hopefully I have shown you all that this is entirely possible with the tools we have been given in Minecraft so far. I will be working on this project more over the next few weeks for sure, and hopefully I have inspired a few of you to try and push these concepts forward as well. And maybe, just maybe, a fully automatic, infinitely mining quarry will arise for vanilla Minecraft. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Theorycraft! Please support me with a like if you enjoyed this video, leave your comments down below.